Malcolm Brogdon and Karis LeVert return, and yet, same old Pacers, 19-point loss to the Celtics. We'll talk about that today, but really today is about the halfway point of the season. Pacers have reached it, and they do not have a good record. They've got to have a better second half. They might have to make some changes. We talked to the players about their halfway point today. Lots to get to on today's Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers. Your daily Indiana Pacers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers as always. My name is Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and the West Side Community News. And joining me today to talk about the Pacers at the halfway point. Crazy that it's already halfway through the season. You wouldn't know it looking at their record where they only have 15 wins. And the Pacers' performance they just had against the Celtics, which can be more aptly described as not a performance. Mr. James Boyd from the Indianapolis Star. James, man, how's it going? I just saw you a couple hours ago, but got to make sure you're still doing good. Couple hours ago, more like one hour ago, like thirty <laughs> minutes ago. But I'm doing good. Um, the team, not so much. That's a, that's a formality question. I ask every guest how they're doing, but most of the time I know what they're going to say. No one's ever been honest and been like, "Yeah, you know, it's a tough week," or you know, this, oh, I'm having a I don't tough have time bad days, Tony. I am undefeated on the Pacers <laughs> beat because I have not played a game. I just write about the team. <laughs> um, have I gone undefeated in stories and pitches and leads? I don't know about that. But, yeah, man, this team, this team is certainly going through some things. Yeah, we, we're going to talk about the Pacers at the halfway point, which will be a lot of, you know, not good stuff. They're not a good team. We asked uh, Karis, Justin Holiday, and Rick Carlisle answered questions about the team at the halfway point after the game they just played. I do want to talk about the game for a little bit. Um, only a little because we've seen that kind of exact kind of game from this Pacers team so often this season where their offense is just completely out of rhythm and, you know, the other team gets hot right at the beginning and you know they all talk about this kind of thing where they say oh you know when you make the other team's making their shots early they get this confidence we just can't stop them and they looked really bad but the, the story of the game to me is Brogdon on the verter back uh they both actually played okay Brogdon gets hurt again but what do you think of the Pacers back to a mostly fully healthy rotation tonight I think that it was a weird mix because those two guys come back and the zeal the hunger the tenacity that they kind of played with the desperation that a lot of these you know g league two-way fringe guys played with just frankly wasn't there i mean i was there in in boston on monday against the same boston team obviously and um ugly game but you couldn't really deny that it was a close game that's kind of how it's been throughout that stretch without brogan and lavert and this game was like they just kind of just let the rope go Never led wire to wire victory for Boston. Um, never felt like Boston was gonna lose, or that. And honestly, it never felt like Indiana had a chance. To be honest with them, I, mean, I, agree. Out, I believe it was like eight to two to start or something like that. They kind of climbed back in it, but um, after a while, it became a Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum show. And obviously, those two players are better than any players that the Pacers have, and it showed. Yeah, those two had seven, or excuse me, sixty-seven, which is nuts. I mean, they they were unreal. It's weird because if you told me before this game, James, that Lavert would play and score 16 points on nine shots, I'd been like, okay, that's pretty good. And then Sabonis would have 17 on 11 shots and six assists. I'd have been like, okay. And then Turner has 18 points on 14 shots. You know, okay, this sounds pretty good. Justin Holiday hits three threes. Like, wow, we're trending towards a pretty good, good game. Just looking at those statistics. Brogdon's going to play. Uh, he did not play super well. He was clearly hurt the whole game. But this one was weird because they got some good individual performances, but like you said, low ball movement, kind of lethargic in general. The bench was really bad in a way that they haven't been in a while. Torrey Craig missed all his shots. Lance really struggled, right? That was weird because those guys had been playing well and with a little bit of oomph, so it was just more of a mixing and matching situation for those guys. I think you know O'Shea was decent at least because he's played with all these guys. But, yeah, they looked off, and they're getting guys back, so – Perhaps it'll take a, a game or two before they're fully going. Uh, you know, Levert, this was his first game out of protocols. They didn't practice yesterday. Same with Gogo, though. He only played garbage oh. time. But it was just another he one. He got of MVP games. chance, though. He got MVP <laughs> chance. Go get so, the, does it Gogo. count as chance if it's like two guys in the section right next to him? <laughs> it counts. It okay. counts. Gogo did get MVP was, chance. To his was, credit. 
He was a positive tonight in his minutes. He did play pretty well. <laughs> in his four minutes, he played pretty well. So I won't harp on this game too much. It's just kind of a good transition into what this team is at the halfway point. But, you know, it seemed like individually some of the performances were good, but it meant nothing. They just they were so arrhythmic and, and not connected. And, you know, when you looked at Boston, who's had that problem a lot this year, they looked very connected all night. And, and it was just a, a very poor performance from the 15 and 27. Sorry, sorry. Let me make sure I said that again. So people can really understand where the Pacers are at now. The 15 and 27 Indiana Pacers. Are you surprised by that record at all? Yeah, I definitely am surprised. But I think, well, I'll put it like this. If you'd have told me at the beginning of the season this would be their record at this point, I would have been surprised. But like having covered the team now for the majority of the season, um, I'm not surprised. Uh they're inconsistent. They lose every single close game, like the one Monday. I mean, they were up four with 45 seconds left and lost. Um, so it's not really surprising to me. And then on top of that, they've been dealing with the injuries and, and stuff like that. I mean, I've we've had a couple feel-good stories with Kiefer Sykes and Lance, you know, coming back. And, you know, even Ahmad Caver getting his first NBA points. But they've got one win to show for it. And honestly, I was thinking, like, wow, that, that Utah win – you know, gave them a little umph, but without that, this, I mean, they've lost, I want to say seven of the last seven eight. Of eight. Yeah. yeah. And, and it doesn't get any easier from here. I mean, they got the, you know, you got Phoenix coming in and then you got the West coast trip coming up with all teams that are pretty good on Clippers are struggling. Um, they're down they're two stars, but even then none of these games are like, okay, that's a win for the Pacers. Yeah. Like a 13 game losing streak was not impossible if they didn't beat Utah that, you know, I mean, the, the ship is sinking anyway, but that game kind of saved a little bit of perception, I would say, mm -hmm. for where they're headed. Because, yeah, I, you know, I agree with you in general that if you told me before the season they'd be 15 and 27, I'd been like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, someone really good gets hurt for a long time or, you know, the, something has to happen big for that to happen. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what's so stunning about the record to me, less so than the, how the season has gone, is that they're that record. And, you know, they've had guys in and out, like you said, there's been. They had the COVID bug at the worst time compared to other teams, I think. Having it at the end when most other teams are coming out of it hurts a little bit. But most in general, like Sabonis and Turner have played nearly every game. Brogdon, comparatively to most of his seasons, has been relatively healthy. Karras missed early season stuff, but once he got going, has played most of his available games besides COVID stuff, right? Outside of Warren, who they knew would be out. Like, nothing catastrophic has happened. So to be at this record, I am surprised by that. But day to day... Right. They're so inconsistent. They lose all the close games. It's like, OK, none of the individual results are stunning. Like most of their losses to teams that have similar records to them are the close ones. Right. So, you know, like, oh, whatever. You lose to Charlotte. Oh, you lose to Washington. Whatever. You know, that, that no big deal. They're, they're OK. But it all adds up when you do it every single time. So that's kind yeah. of where I feel like this team's just like they just come up short every single time it matters. and Every single time they have a chance to make a statement. And then they've had like. I don't say bad luck, but they've had some really horrible calls in, in the last few. I do want to point that out because I think that it's okay to say they're not a good team. They lose all the close games, which is true. They don't they don't have a number one go-to guy who can just I mean, look yeah, at no, no one's gonna score. dispute that they're not a good team. <laughs> right. <laughs> <You know>? I mean <laughs> but uh I mean you you look at their personnel and you know they don't have a go-to wing player who's gonna break you down and be that, you know, guy at the end of the game. They just don't have that. But on top of that, it's compounded with, you know, two or three games this year where there have been some really bad calls. And then, you know, like right before New Year's Eve, right before the turn of the new year on New Year's Eve, DeRozan hits a one-legged shot to beat you at the buzzer. And it's like, how much worse can it get? So, I mean, there's just been a combination of things. But overall, I think the weirdest thing is just like, they have these spurts where they just – they don't look, like, lively. It's just weird. Like, it happened tonight. I know Justin Holiday pointed it out, and it was kind of unprompted. It wasn't like, hey, you guys didn't play hard. What happened? He's just like, no, I think we have these spells where we just aren't playing hard enough. And, you know, Karis is saying, you know, we got a lot of games left. Not really. I mean, you Not are really. what you are at this point. I mean, I would be shocked that they won – more than three games in a row at any point for the rest of the season. I, I'm just being honest. I, I don't see this team streaking, getting hot. Um, what I do see is some potential movement because of uh, cryptic tweets <laughs> and other things, you know, more on court things other than the cryptic tweets that everyone gets riled up about. But um, yeah, man, this team is that. just, 
Yeah, we'll talk about it. I mean, we can talk about it now. I'll let you we'll dive into it. it. Not yet, not yet. It's two away on the itinerary that I oh, forgot. Oh, to send. we got an itinerary. Bad we podcast. Those, I, I did, did not, not send James itinerary. the itinerary. So. <laughs> but yeah, it's been a weird season, um, rough season, and they've been unlucky at some points, but they've been also just downright bad at other points. So yeah, I mean, it is what it is. Hey guys, one quick little break to talk to you all about the good folks over at Prize Picks. You've been hearing me tell you about for months, but you've got to sign up yourself. And if you haven't, now is the perfect time for a limited time. Prize Picks has an exclusive no brainer of an offer for all our their users for fifty dollars for free if a player in your first Prize Picks entry scores a single point. But you must use the code NBA when you sign up. That is right, exclusive offer for Locked On Pacers fans. Just use the code NBA when you sign up at Prize Picks. They have the best NBA DFS props on the market and offer more NBA props than any other prop operator and offers all the superstar players as well as the bench guys. Any prop you can think of, points, assists, rebounds, threes made, they've got it. You pick two to five players and an over-under for their projections. You can up to 10 times on any entry. It's just you versus the projected numbers. You've got to try it. Go to prizepicks.com today, download the app, and I'll use the deposit. Use that promo code NBA. You'll get your free $50 if your first entry scores a single point. Free fifty dollars if you use that code NBA. Prize picks is daily fantasy made easy. The bad luck and margin for error is pretty jarring. Like, okay, so we have the Hawks game where Herder fouls Duarte. So obviously, yeah, like, that, that was the worst really. missed call by a mile. Yes. and they lose by one. They have the the three against the Lakers with no call. Like that one, yeah, it was a foul. But that one, I get why it wasn't called. At least, like, right. I'm like, I kind of shrug a little bit more down. And he made it right. Like the refs. You know, that one might have been called if you missed it in one of those late whistle situations. Right. They got hosed at the end of that Bulls game. Even give them just one of those. Just give them one, right? Yeah. And then say they're 5-8 and eight in their four-point game. Still bad, but credible. All of a sudden, they're 20-23 and 23 with a tough schedule. It's like, that's not so bad. You know, the margin, that's not even that crazy of a season. Like, 5-8 yeah. and eight in close games is still bad. Getting hosed twice would still suck. And even then, you'd be like, yeah, they, you know, they, they're fine. They can recover. They've got one of the five easiest schedules coming up. But every opportunity they've had... They, they've just like like that's that shows how bad they've been in every in these opportunities they just miss them all they miss every single one and it's been a problem for them and that's kind of what I was hoping to hear from players today is the word problem or what they wanted to address Scott and I Scott Agnes asked Justin Holiday or excuse me Karis LeVert and I asked Justin Holiday and Rick Carlisle like what do you think the biggest problem for this team is going forward Rick Carlisle sort of danced around the question I I, I don't really know how to describe his answer to <laughs> To my question, I'm not going to lie. You know, he he always is a little more up beyond the team, which makes sense. He's the one making the decisions and leading them. Um, in an interview, Justin Holiday blatantly said, "Defense, we got to get better at defense." I agree. The pay, you know Pritch- Pritchard talked all off season about they want to get back to the the hard hat lunch pail Pacers, as he called it, right? The defense sort of team, and they have not been that at all. They have been in recent seasons, and they've been really good. And Justin Holiday, I think, is right to call out that that is their one of at least their biggest problems this season. And I did not expect that to be a problem for them this season, though I did not expect them to be 21st in defense. But James, what do you in your chair feel like the biggest issue? And we might've already covered it, you know, with some of these inconsistencies, what do you feel like has been plaguing this team the most? And can they correct it in the second half of the season? I think it's just, they don't really fit together. I mean, they're, they've never felt like they fit together this year in particular. I can't speak on last year because I wasn't here obviously. And, you know, not a lot of Pacers games on national TV, but um, I think they just really don't fit. I mean, even when certain guys have big nights, they just don't win them, which is so weird to me. I mean, you, you had talked about a game where the Montes Bonus had a 25 rebound triple double. They lost. He had another you know triple double the other day. They lost. Um, you know, so it's like I feel like the, the one game as of late where like everyone was really clicking was a Utah game, you know, where Lance has a career night with assists off the bench with 14. And, you know, Domas has uh, is a beneficiary of that and has, a you know, a career night with 42 points. But I think the biggest thing is that these pieces don't fit and it just feels stagnant. And when you watch the team, um, even when I was in Miami a few weeks ago, like the body language of guys after you're constantly getting beat, after you're, you're not really – you know, uh, fitting together, uh, moving the ball well. It's just it, it feels like there needs to be something done to change the team. I know Lance gave them some life, but Lance isn't a savior. I mean, Lance is not a superstar. Um, sorry, Pacers fans. Uh, you know, I know he gets his powers when he puts on the Pacers jersey, and he's been pretty good for them. 
Um, since he signed, you know, obviously he had the two great games. But to me, the biggest thing is that they just don't fit. And I think this year is probably becoming more evident than any other year. It's, it, you know, in years past, it's like, oh, they're good enough to get to the playoffs, but they're going to be a first run out. This year, it's like you got this same core. Granted, they've been hurt and in and out, but even when they're together, they, they don't really win at a high rate. So I think that it just feels stale and, and something's got to be, uh, you know, splashed or sprinkled on them to kind of, you know, mix it up. I've got stats for you for your point. You ready? Yes, so ready. last year, and this was kind of valid, right? Warren missed a ton of last year. Brogdon missed like two months. Levert missed two months. Turner missed the last month and a half. Like they had a lot more out time last year than this year. But last year, the end of the season, Pritchard's like, we want to see the team healthy. And a lot of fans were like, no, you know, you're not, it's not that good. But people like could get it at that point, right? So I'm going to remove Warren from the equation because he's been played in 13 months. But last year, the Pacers had 10 games where all four of Turner, Sabonis, Brogdon, and Levert all played in the same game. What do you think their record was in those 10 games? Not this season, last season. Last season, I go. Seven and three. Uh, five and five. So you're, oh, you know, well, so last year when they had all four available, five and five. This year, this is prior to tonight, by the way. So this is actually worse than than it says. This year, eighteen games with all four of those guys. Eight and ten. Eight and eleven now that they lost to Boston, right? So like the core that you're saying doesn't fit, obviously doesn't fit. Like that's third. What is that? Thirteen and and nineteen, and that's you know it's only thirty two games. It's not a huge sample, sure, but. It clearly something does not work about this core, and they need a wing enforcer for sure. But I mean, the role players are at least fine; like they have some NBA skills. You're right; They're, this core does not fit. It was a good idea, I think, to move Oladipo for that Lavert deal, but they were much better with Oladipo and the way he fit with the team and could defend a lot better than Karras than they are with the roster they have now. And I, I agree that that's a huge problem that their four supposedly best or highest paid players just haven't gelled. They have not found a way to be super successful on the court at the same time. Like they had really good success at the end of last year with just Levert and Domas, right? That, that makes sense to me. And they've had really good success with like just a couple of the pairing, but when all of them play, they're just not that good. Right. And so that is sort of the crux of the whole thing. And th that team can't defend well together. There were two reliant on miles on defense and sometimes too reliant on one of those four on offense. It just, it doesn't fit. And, and that, that's sometimes I feel like, all these players don't fit together. It's like lazy analysis. But in this case, I think we have enough years of evidence to say, you know what? They don't. They don't fit. Yeah, I think I get more feel for that when I'm on these road trips and you see the team. And uh, unlike at the Patriots arena where we uh, are sitting up high, a lot of these other places we get to sit kind of close to the court or near the bench and you just hear little things. I'm not like, you know, some fly on the wall where I know everything that's ever said. Around, around, but it's just it's weird seeing just how draining it is to run the same thing out there or the same group of guys or to say the same things after games. Like, like what Karis told us today about there being a lot of games left. I'm pretty sure like if I just searched through my phone, um, you know, my recordings, I could find a, a quote from him earlier in the season where he probably said the, most, the same thing almost verbatim. Cause I remember writing about it after he said it. So yep. it's, it's, I get it. You want to be positive. You don't want to be the guy on the team that's negative. We can't fix this, but I'll be the person to tell you the truth. You're not going to fix it. Like, this is who you are. Um, I am very much a believer of that, not only in basketball, but just in life. Like, people show you who you are. After a while, like, there's not much changing going to go on. Um, and this is, you know, what they've been all year. So it's disappointing. But to me, it's not surprising at this point just because of everything that's kind of going on and the lack of continuity. I mean, they just look so stained in tonight. Unlike when they were trying out a bunch of, you know, G League guys and former two-way guys and things like that, the lack of ball movement to start was, was 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 very like you know night and day compared to what was going on before. So, um, you know, get those guys back if they're gonna, you know, if the Karras is gonna have the ball, if Mouth is gonna have the ball, and you know, do things with the ball, they got to be able to play make a little bit more, and it just felt more kind of. You know, you take it, I'll take it, and then you you get stuck as a last resort pass as, a, as opposed to making a pass to, you know, get something done uh, proactively rather than reactively. So it's weird. Um, we'll see where they go. But, I mean, like you said, the schedule, I'm looking at the schedule. This is probably the toughest part of the season for the schedule. Yeah. So Brutal stretch coming up. And in this Boston game, you're right. Like, I was there. I saw it. And I don't think they played well. But it's weird because – 
so like I can't tell if if I just was too much looking at the ball because if they make the same number of threes as the Celtics, they win by 14, right? Like they played very well in on the interior and their defense on everyone besides the two studs wasn't like terrible. Schroeder was pretty good, right? So like I, I guess I yeah they played bad. Like I was there, but something about that game and the stats doesn't match to me, and so I need to rewatch it because it's just weird. Like they just shot awful from three, that which makes it hard to really assess how much they're doing. And if I watch too much of the ball, I always get caught like that. Like, right. Like, Mm -hmm. Oh, the possession ended with a miss. That was bad, but like, it could have been good. And I just missed something about it. But one more break here, guys, to talk about the good folks over at betonline.ag who would like to wish you a happy new betting year. As we continue our March to the playoffs and beyond football playoffs coming right up and bet online remains the number one spot for all the sports wagering action for 2022 New year and a new updated desktop and mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. All you got to do is use our code locked on all one word when you sign up to get started football, basketball, hockey, boxing, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for 2022. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports. Bet online is where the game starts. Regardless, you tipped the next question I wanted to go to earlier in one of your answers. What what direction do they go the second half? I mean, I think it, I think it's obvious, right? Like when you have the fifth ish worst record in the league, I think it is fifth now. I mean, you you have to be like a seller, or at least adjacent, a seller adjacent, where you're making forward thinking, if not rebuilding moves, right? I don't I don't know if you agree or disagree with that, but that's kind of where I'm at. Where you can't kind of sit on your loins and wait anymore. You didn't make the playoffs last year, and you're 15 and 27. Yeah, I think the irony of Herb Simon and, and you know, he did his uh, sit down, I believe, with you and a few others um, a while back. And, you know, he was saying he doesn't want to tank and he likes his team and, you know, they're going to retool or whatever. And the irony in that is that they've like tanked, but like not wanting to. Like they just lost a bunch of close games and they have lost pretty much since that point. I mean, Things have not – they've gotten drastically worse since then, honestly. I mean, it probably looked a little better outlook then for for him to be able to say that, like, oh, we can turn around. But I think at that point it might have been maybe five or six games underneath 500. But at this point, the rope has been let go. Um, You know, where you were, where you thought you'd be um, is not where you are. So it's – I think it's time. I think think the trade – when the trade line rolls around – I do not think this team will look exactly how it looks now. Um, And I think that it would be to the Pacers' benefit to make some moves and take some offers and listen and really look at this roster because, I mean, if you run it back, what are you getting? Even if they're all healthy, even if they're all available, you're going to get a a first-round exit team, which, I mean, that's better than what you're doing now. But that's what is that – what has that done for the Pacers in the last – Half decade. I mean, it's 2022 now. I want to say the last Eastern Conference Finals appearance was was, was that 14, 15, or 13, 14? We have 13, 14. So it's been a while. You know what I mean? And the last one that, that, that they went to the Eastern Conference Finals, they had a guy named Paul George. You know, a really good wing. So maybe you try to move and get younger and try to draft a guy like him. But I don't know. I'm not the GM, not the president, but I do know if you run this back, these results that we're seeing right now will happen again, and we can't say, oh, it, it, well, we didn't know. No, it's going to just be what we knew was going to happen. First of all, if you want evidence that time is not real, the Herb Simon comments were less than a month ago. I, I, that feels wow. so so long ago to me. It that was like an eternity. I know. That feels so long ago. It was December 15th, right? That does not feel that long ago. The Pacers since then, right? So, so first of all, let's, let's go back to that time. They had a three-game winning streak the week before that. They barely lost to Steph. The day before, right? Yep. So they were playing actually probably the best they've played all season at that point, honestly. So Herb is confident-ish, and he's like, "Yeah, we're gonna retool and build on the go." And you know, I, I think things are trending in the right direction. In attendance, like I, I like, I like our little team, and we're headed, blah blah blah. Okay, since then they have three wins, three wins. It's, that was December fifteenth. They have three wins since then. They have ten losses. They're three and ten since then. So yeah, he. I mean. He can't, they can't do what he said. Like, they just can't. They have to be, I don't think they have to be like aggressive rebuilders necessarily, but I do think, I mean, we talked about it. Their best players don't fit, and you have to get better pieces that do fit, A, around those guys, whichever ones you end up keeping, and B, 
your young guys that are good and Chris Duarte and Isaiah Jackson shown some flashes. You got to find minutes for Goga eventually. At least I one would think you would. I mean, maybe they uh, won't. I don't know. <laughs> maybe they I never don't... will. And I Wayne say that because like, he just hasn't nice, really like, played. Like he hasn't really yeah, played. Not at all. And I feel like if he's not going to play at this point, when you're this, you know, far under under 500, it's unbelievable. What what are we doing here? So I mean, like I said, he got his MVP chance. <laughs> but jokes aside, I mean, that's a guy who was a first round pick for you. So um, if you mail it in on him, how does that look? So. They've got a lot of issues. I know when you ask Rick Carlisle, like, what's the biggest thing you want to build on or what's, like, the biggest problem you've seen throughout the season, you know, he kind of took a deep breath. And I was thinking, yeah, we all could do that because there's just so <laughs> many things to look at with this team yeah. that culminate with, you know, some of these poor performances and just a poor overall season. So, yeah, with Goga, he's at 170 minutes plus his four and a half tonight this season. So hundred, let's just say 175. And we're at, at the halfway point. If he plays 175 in the second half of the season, he'll finish with 350 minutes, which would be his lowest total ever in his third season. And it's not even that he's playing worse than either of the last two years. They just aren't playing him at all. It's befuddling. I think he's, like, decent enough. He should be playing as a backup center. I get why he's not, but I think he should be. Crazy to think about that. It is a halfway point. We're going to do some, some lazy takes here. Are you ready? Let's do it. James Boyd. Keep it simple here. Team MVP through 41 games. 42, whatever. Demontis Sabonis, you know this. Good job. <laughs> Not a trick question. So you know this. You already know how I feel about Demontis. And I have I wrote about I wrote about this last week. I said, you know, the Patriots have some good players. They have one great player. And I got berated. He's not great. He's not this. We don't have any great players. And what does Sabonis do? He goes out and he gets a triple-double. And he has, like, 42 points. He has another triple-double. So, I mean, the guy has – even though, like, I think what impressed me the most about the Boston game Monday was that he played bad and missed a bunch of bunnies, but he had 23 rebounds, 11 points, and 10 assists. Still. Still. So, I mean, I personally, I judge players off their bad nights. Like, anybody can get going in the NBA. I don't say anybody, but, like, any NBA player can get going in the NBA and have a big night. But what do you do when you're not having your night? How else do you impact the game? So I think he's a clear MVP of the team. He's a clear best player. Um, the only one who's had an all-star appearance as of late. Um, he will not be getting another all-star appearance because um, teams that are really no. you know, this bad will not. And then somebody asked me that on Twitter. Hey, what about Sabonis? No, he's not going to the all-star game. Lance Stevenson might actually get more, more vote fan votes <laughs> than Demontis, which is insane. But team MVP, Sabonis, easily. I agree. Uh, I, you know how I feel about this because I've talked to you at games about before. I still think per minute possession game, whatever, Brogdon's a better like per rate player or per moment player, but he hasn't played enough. He just uh, yeah. Yeah, this is the same story every year, right? And that makes Sabonis the top value guy on the team for sure. You know, Miles' defense at times has led him to be this guy, but he's really struggled the last couple weeks, and so yeah, it's Sabonis to me. It's frankly <laughs> separating to a point where it's not close. Another lazy question for you. Most, Im I guess you didn't cover the team last year, but I'll still want your take here. Most improved Pacer this season? I'll probably say O'Shea. Good O'Shea answer. does okay. good things whenever he's in. Um, I like what he does. I like what he brings. I think even tonight he had like a putback dunk <laughs> where they were down 15 or 17. He dunks it and he's, he's bringing that energy. I like O'Shea. I think O'Shea does good things whenever he's in and you don't necessarily have to worry about the inconsistency in his effort, which is more or less the problem with the team. He brings it every night. I don't know if it's always pot, like a good thing, like he's not going to make a bunch of shots every night, but he's pretty good for like one or two offensive rebounds, a block, a steal, or something showing off his effort in those hustle plays. So I'll go with Shea. I know um, he's in his third year, um, you know, had his contract guaranteed to the rest of the season, along with Kiefer Sykes, which is no surprise. But, um, yeah, I would go – him. I don't know what you're thinking. Obviously, I didn't watch as many Pacers games as everybody else did last year, but I would say him. I think that he's taken a step forward this year. I want to talk about this, and I, I did a little bit of prep, but not a lot. I, the answer is kind of nobody <laughs> nobody to me, so that, that's really embarrassing. O'Shea was in the running for me. You know who I would have answered with is Keelan Martin, but he got cut. Yes, exactly. So he can't be my winner by default. He was barely a rotation player last year and was actually valuable for them and 
you know, him having a, a month long slump right before the cut down deadline really hurt them as did Kiefer Sykes playing awesome at a position they need. So I think O'Shea has to be the answer. I mean, basically everybody else has been worth like Sabonis maybe has been a little better. I suppose Lance has been better than last year. Um, in his in his five, six game stint now. So you know, I, th- th- that is kind of how I close out analyzing the first half Pacers. They're not better than last year. They have no. almost the same roster, and they're not better than last year, and that is jarring. And that's that you know they got to do something about it. And I don't know what they do. I don't know how they figure it out. I'm not in charge. I have my opinions, and I will air them out next week when every player in the NBA can get traded who can legally get traded. But I mean, they have to do something. They're getting they're going backwards, and you know even every team in the NBA will tell you even stagnating is bad. You always want to be improving and moving forwards and moving towards what you want to be one day. And growth is not some linear line. There's ups and downs, but there is no backwards. And they're going backwards. And that is and there's no growth of, right now. None. No, this is what you are. This is their their peak is not worth keeping this core together, if that makes sense. This I agree. Not- I agree. Changes are coming. I think we both know it. To what extent? I don't know. Pritchard has not been a midseason trade guy ever. So I'll let us end on a positive note, which no one wants to do because they're 15 and 27. I put this on the itinerary, and I, this one I should have prepped. I should have allowed you to prep for. Your favorite story, you're a journalist, favorite story from the team this whole season. Not that you wrote, just about the team this whole season. I think I know what you're going to say. Favorite story about the team? Or involving the team, I suppose. Involving the team. Honestly, I'd probably go uh, Kiefer Sykes, his I thought you'd say mom that. question. Uh, everyone knows, he follows me on Twitter. I love my mom, my best friend. Super close to her. Um, call her every day, pretty much. Um, so, yeah, she's the one who keeps me from acting too crazy. And I think that because of my relationship with her, it made me linger on um, when he talked about her previously. So I asked him about her after he got his guaranteed contract and everyone saw the video. Um, you know, he got all heartfelt. And I think that was a cool reminder of even throughout this chaotic season for not only the patient, but the entire league and, and really the world dealing with. COVID and, and Omicron, the opportunity that has given a lot of these players, including Kiefer, to chase his dream. If you all haven't watched the documentary, um, Shy Town on Amazon Prime, free promo there, Amazon, I'll collect my money in the morning. Um, <laughs> but yeah, watch that documentary and then you'll really get an understanding of why he felt that way about his mom. Um, but yeah, that was one. And I've had to go like runner up, it'd probably be a Ma Caver, um, the story that I did when me and you talked to him just on his last day of his 10 deal, I mean, 10 day deal. Um, you know, this is a guy who may not get back to the NBA. I hope he does. I, I would I never want to kill anybody's dreams, but he scored two points to ruin a bunch of bets. And basically the story was about how he bet on himself all his life to get to that point, to be able to score two points in the NBA, which seems so meaningless to everyone, but meant the world to him because he worked his whole life for it. So that was an interesting story to write. Um, it was one that I just voluntarily wrote ones like I had to do it. It was like, you know, this I, I was kind of mad that people were saying some really horrible stuff to him, like stuff that people just say on the Internet because they would never see this guy in real life. But um, it was cool to kind of get his thoughts on it and, and realize that, you know, again, it's, it's much bigger than those two points. And, you know, he was on the court with Kevin Durant and James Harden. He, he told us, Tony, like, hey, wouldn't you take that opportunity? Like, who wouldn't right. do that? So that was another fun story. We'll have others, I'm sure. But um, I think that, honestly, when you're – covering a team like this, you got to be creative. You got to, you know, you got to think outside the box to find those stories that still are, you know, somewhat positive. Cause I'm the type of person, I can't write negative things over and over and over and over and over again. So I'll find some crevice of positivity somewhere. to like grasp onto and write about, you know, to kind of balance it out. But you know, that's the NBA grind. And that's this season. You know, we got what, 40 games left. And, 40 uh, games left about this, uh, this, Whatever to call them, team crummy. I think How many do they win, win Tony? <laughs> Forty games left. How many do they win? I don't know. Sixteen. I think they go thirty-one and forty-one, or forty-three. There we go. Numbers. No, I was right the first time. Thirty-one and forty-one. It's my official prediction for their ending. Terrible place to be. You, you, <laughs> for those of you who have stuck with us for thirty-two minutes and forty seconds, I want to tell you a story about that Ahmad Caver story that James Boyd wrote. And I, I know James wants to get out of here, so I won't be too long on this. The feature's really good. You should read it in the Indie Star. We were talking to Caver for what was it, like 14 minutes, 13 yeah, minutes. Yeah. The reason this is a, the, maybe the coolest interview I'll ever do is because of the way he was on the team. He was on a 10-day hardship deal, right? And it expired that day. It, we were talking to him on Sunday. 
And the Pacers were flying to Boston after practice. So the only people in the gym were a PR person, James, me, and Ahmad. And when we left, he was off the team. Like, he doesn't fly to Boston. He's not playing the next day, yeah. right? So we're talking yeah. to a guy who's literally potentially soaking up his last moments in an NBA gym ever, right? It was really I, – I mean, I might never be in that situation with a player again where they're like, wow, when I leave, it's over. You know, it, it was crazy to, to, like, contextualize that situation. His story's really cool. You should read James's piece. My brief sentence on my favorite story of the year is Chris Duarte's journey to the NBA. It, it's just, You should read that, yes. It was, it was, that, was, <laughs> that, was, that was – everyone read that. I think – Chris is one of those guys where, like, he's really, really humble. And I think capturing that early on was really cool. And obviously, he just had the daughter. Um, you know, he yeah. missed a couple of games. I haven't even which, talked about um, that. You know, it was honestly great to write that someone missed a game because of something positive and not a positive test. <laughs> you know, so that was a good thing. I did get concerned when Carlisle, you know, because I did not know his, his girlfriend. Uh, I remember begging remember that she was pregnant, but I, I didn't, like, put two and two together. So he said the personal reasons I'm thinking, oh, um, you know, hopefully his family's OK. And they're more than OK. Just we'll welcome one more. So maybe we'll see him again Friday. Who knows? But, um, you know, I'll give him some slack, you know, being a being a new father and getting a new daughter out there. Again, something else positive that I'm, I'm looking forward to asking him about just, you know, how it changes him, how it maybe refocuses him. He's a guy who's always kind of kept the big picture in mind. So, yeah, I definitely don't, uh, you know you know get on you i won't get on you for having that as your top story just because i mean who, who cool. doesn't like it i mean it, it's a feel-good story chris duarte is a feel-good type of guy so there you go yeah where he came from and his route of low well, late high school juco is very rare uh, so i i love that and we didn't even get to talk about miles turner's tweet today so i'll just cliff notes it for everybody i suppose so we can actually get out that of ain't p he tweeted that ain't p with the p emoji which is a reference to a gunna album or music whatever i'm not hip or don't cool. worry i I've, I've tried i've i've linked it out on my page it still doesn't <laughs> really make much sense we have not talked to miles since his that ain't p tweet um hopefully carlisle says he's not on twitter uh so he hasn't really seen it so he just He's proud of Miles' professionalism throughout his whole career. Was his before the game conversation? Uh, uh, not not quite word salad, but not a, a no a nothing answer for the for where that's at. So we'll see. Miles played pretty well against the Celtics. Honestly, eighteen points. He he played all right. So if if he keeps playing like that, it doesn't really matter. It, I mean, he you know he could be upset with this role all the time, but if he plays like that, the Pacers don't really care until they have to care. Basically. So there you go. My take on that. I don't know if you have any other thoughts, but. James, I've kept you six minutes over my time. Where can people follow you and all your stuff? Romeoville Kid on Twitter, Instagram, pretty much every social media. Um, I try to keep it fun, you know, make sure you got the keep the gifts ready, the gifs, however you call it. I like to ask you all how you're feeling. And, um, you know, it, it keeps it light. I mean, this is basketball. This isn't some, you know, catastrophic thing that's going on it's a team that's not playing well. So keep that in perspective. Enjoy it. You know, when you can enjoy those little pockets of things like Kiefer, Ahmad, Chris Duarte and his family. Um, and then obviously we'll, we'll see what happens because it's going to get interesting here real soon. Very soon. Uh, next three days soon. Thank you guys a ton for listening. As you know, I'm on Twitter at T East NBA and this show at locked on Pacers. Well, we will of course cover the second half of this miserable Pacer season. Thank you all for listening. Hope you have a great day, and we will see you tomorrow.